Good morning. Good morning. I, I'm here today with Representative Jerry Bermelin, who served in the 139th Legislative District, which encompassed parts of Pike, Susquehanna, Wayne, and Monroe counties from the years 1985 to 2006. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. I want to first ask you, what kind of influence did your family have on your early life and your future career as a public servant? Uh, probably not much. <laughs> I think I went my own way. Uh, other than a brother who had served on a school board, which was after I had become elected, uh, my family didn't experience a whole lot of political involvement. Uh, they weren't too concerned about things like that. I, I don't even know if my mother and father voted, to tell you the truth. Uh, I just know that it was an interest of or a subject of great interest for me when I became a, a high school student, and that's why I pursued that course. Well, how did you become involved in politics? Well, I was a teacher for 10 years, off and on, and uh, I taught history and government. And I incorporated a lot of current events into my history courses uh, because my high school history teacher had done that, and I had always been interested in that. And my first real awakening in the political realm was when the Kennedy-Nixon race was held in 1960 for the presidency. And that sort of got me started in this area of interest, and it just continued. I began, as I said, to be a teacher teaching history and government. And, I told people that I got the political bug in 1980 when I first ran and uh, have had it ever since. Uh, and, and essentially it was a question of whether or not I wanted to just teach about what was happening in politics or if I wanted to do something about it. And being more of a hands-on person, I decided I'd rather do something about politics than simply teach about it. So I ran in 1980 and lost. I ran in 1982 and lost. And in 1984, I was ultimately successful in winning in November. Would you say you always had political aspirations? No, probably not until around 1980. Um, that's, that's why I say the political bug bit me. Uh, I, I was very interested in politics, but hadn't thought of running myself until about 1980. But once I thought about running, then it was a sort of a consuming desire for a few years. Um, what influenced you to become a Republican? Well, here's the interesting thing. I ran in 1980s Democrat, and I was a registered Democrat uh, before that, primarily because my mother-in-law wanted me to register as a Republican. And I said, I'm not doing what my mother-in-law wants me to do, so I registered as a Democrat. I was younger. I was also uh, maybe caught up a little bit more in the, the liberal issues of the day. <clears throat> and so when I ran in 1980, I ran as a Democrat. Um, I soon discovered that because of my positions being as conservative as they were, that the Democratic Party really didn't want me to be one of their candidates. And so I, in 1982, uh, switched over to the Republican Party, which was much more in line with my political philosophy at that point in time, and still is, and ran in 1982 and lost. Uh, and then in 1984, I was successful in being elected as a Republican. Oh, thank you. Could you describe your career? You talked about being a teacher and your experience before coming to the House, and how did that impact your role as a legislator? I think it gave me a little better appreciation for the political system and for our government. I, you know, very much was into government and politics. And I think that uh, as I would examine what government was doing in all different levels, federal, state, and local, uh, I felt that, unfortunately, many of the things that were done were not being driven by a political philosophy. They were being driven by political pragmatism, by in many cases just simply the desire to be in control by one party or the other and I thought that's probably not the best way to run our country uh, especially when you get on the national and the state level it's not so much it's not so partisan on the local level I don't think uh, but I just felt that uh, the philosophy that I had about why government should be doing what it should be doing it was what motivated me to run to be a part of that so why did you run for the House of Representatives? <laughs> uh, it's not a good answer. Uh, it was in 1980 when I got that political bug I was talking about. It was the lowest office on the ballot. <laughs> so I said I'll start at the bottom, which were, really wasn't the bottom of the political scale. But uh, in 1980 it was because the, the last ballot position was state representatives. So I said, that's what I'll run for. Okay. That's not a good answer, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, did anyone help you get started? In yeah, I had, a guy, I had some friends that, you know, uh, encouraged me. They, they must have gotten some of the political bug themselves too, but didn't want to be candidates. And uh, they encouraged me to run, and they said they would work for me, and they did, and uh, that's how I got started. Could you describe the aspects of your first three campaigns, I guess, and how they differed with uh, your other campaigns? Well, the first campaign, as I said, I ran as a Democrat candidate. Oh. I got washed away in the Reagan uh, tidal wave. Uh, my opponent uh, 
the Republican didn't really do a whole lot. He didn't campaign a lot. He didn't have to. Uh, he was well known. I wasn't. And uh, although I worked hard, I did a lot of door to door. I didn't have much money, and I didn't have any name recognition. So in 1980 was my real learning experience. And and the the thing that helped me the most in 1980 was I made a lot of friends who would then and at a later time help me again. The 1982 campaign was one in which I by this point had converted over to the Republican Party which I felt was more appropriate. But they had changed my district through reapportionment and the 1982 election was new districts and where I'd run before I was no longer running again and that, that small portion of Wayne County that I lived in uh, was reapportioned into a Democratic controlled district in Lackawanna County. So when I ran in 1980, I ran as a Democrat in a heavy Republican district. In 1982, I ran as a Republican in a heavy Democrat district. I obviously wasn't able to figure that out until 1984 when the guy that I had run against and lost to in 1980 announced his retirement. So it was an open seat in 1984 in the 139th. I moved, literally, <laughs> about 10 miles to be back in the 139th district and was successful in getting, re getting elected in 1984. Do you like to campaign? Uh, some, things about, some of the things I like about it. I, I've, I've always enjoyed the contact with people and the opportunity to talk with them in small settings or one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I, I felt my experience as a teacher helped me to learn to get along with people and to listen to people as opposed to just trying to talk to them and have them listen to me. There are some things I don't particularly care for, never have cared for, for instance, parades. I, I, I always have felt kind of out of place sitting in a car waving at people and wondering why they would care to see their state representative sitting in a car. I mean, I wouldn't care to see that, so I don't know why other people would. And there's some uh, situations where maybe in large groups where, you know, there's three, four hundred people and you're part of that event. and. You know, you're not really contributing to it, so it, it oftentimes, I wouldn't say it's a waste of time, but it's kind of one of the things you got to do in politics, but it's not really enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the makeup of the 139th district? Well, right now, the 139th includes about a third of Wayne County, two thirds of Pike County, and two townships in Monroe County. Uh, what the, the phenomenon that I've had to experience is that I've had the fastest growing house seat in Pennsylvania in the last 10 years. Uh, when the reapportionment was done in 2002, I had 20,000 more people than I was supposed to have. We normally you have 60,000, I had 80, over 80,000, and it was still growing. Pike County, which is one of the three counties I represent, is the fastest growing in the state. So I've had this continual change and influx of people in my district who, uh, primarily from the, the urban in suburban New York City area don't have the foggiest idea who their legislators are or county commissioners or their congressmen sometimes and uh, so it's very difficult to reach the public and to serve them when they're move-ins and they're growing at such a large number and there's a lot of flexibility and, and, and influx of new people it's that's that's been a challenge to do that well what makes your your district unique uh, probably the one thing that I think makes it uh, unique is that it's it's filled with gated communities. The uh, gated communities of Pike County in particular, but Monroe and Wayne to a lesser extent, are such that uh, you have communities within communities within communities. People will come to Pike County and buy a home <coughs> or rent a, a property that is within some place called Hemlock Farms or you know, Lake Conishaw or Lake Wallenpawpack Estates or something, something like that, that basically that becomes their community. They don't realize that they're in a township or that they're in a borough. They don't realize the county that they're in. And I wonder sometimes if they realize they're in Pennsylvania because their, their whole focus is on that little gated community. And so you ultimately have, instead of maybe uh, 40 types of you know, townships or boroughs, you wind up with 140 communities. <clears throat> and they, they unfortunately tend to think only of those smaller communities. They don't think of the larger community that they belong to. And so that's been hard. It's hard to reach people when they're in a gated community because they're, there's a gate there. The problem with the gated communities is it doesn't give them a sense of 
where they're living in their neighbors other than that smaller community. I don't know how many other legislators experience that, but it's very difficult to reach into that gated community to let them know who you are, what you're, you know, what you can do for them in terms of constituent service, but also to get their input on legislation. Uh, not only is it a gated community, heavily gated community, it's also a bedroom community. Since it, we are so close, particularly in Pike County to New York City, we have the phenomenon where a lot of those people don't see much sunlight in Pennsylvania. <laughs> they're on the road at 5.30 in the morning. They don't get back till 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night. They're traveling back and forth, uh, spending a lot of time on the road. Unfortunately, their children are alone a lot at home, the quote-unquote latchkey kids. And sometimes the parents just work in the suburban New York City area. Uh, they leave Monday morning, don't come back till Friday. So you have that phenomenon where their main focus is their job. To a great extent, it consumes their lives and you know, they don't really uh, have an appreciation for or an involvement in the community as a, lar as a, as a hard, larger entity. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you reach these constituents? What, what By mail, mostly. By mail. <laughs> they do have mail. <laughs> and they have email. Um, and our legislative service here has been pretty good at preparing emails for us so that when an issue comes up, uh, for instance, if we need to notify people about the deadlines for registering to vote, uh, we send out what are known as email blasts, which go to as many people that we have email addresses for as we can. And right now, I think in my legislative district, that number is somewhere around 5,000. Mm -hmm. So that helps. Uh, we can do mailings. That gets to be more expensive. Emails cost very little. Uh, we do try to notify the different communities through the newspapers of events that are happening or things that we think they should know about. Uh, and we also do some public service announcements on the radio and on television, but that too can be expensive, so they're, they're very limited in what you can do. Do you have a website? Yes, I have a website. Uh, it's been jerrybermlin.com. It's no longer any good after November 30th, 2006. <laughs> so I don't recommend that people use it. Uh, but uh, it, that has helped too, because I, I put it on all of my literature. I, put, I give away pens with it on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to let people know. And we, and we get some emails that way. Um, probably, I would say, say probably about 30 to 40 emails per month mm -hmm. come in as a result of my website. Could you explain how you felt at your first swearing-in ceremony? Uh, it was a little overwhelming. Um, if anyone's ever been to the first day of session, there's a, it looks like a, a greenhouse. There are potted flowers everywhere. And so you, it's almost like a jungle, and you know you're trying to wade through the jungle to find your seat and and get sworn in. It, and it all goes by rather quickly. And you know some family and friends are there, and they're taking photos. And it doesn't really sink into you um, that, that you're actually a state representative until you come back in later January. The desks are clear, the laptops are there, and you're down to business. Mm -hmm. What were your first impressions of the house? First impression of the house was this is a uh, this is an institution that when we are in session goes 100 miles an hour and when we're not goes about 10 miles an hour, and the, at 100 miles an hour is very difficult to keep up with because you have to be a, a jack of all trades so to speak. You you have legislation dealing on such a variety of issues from during the course of one day, let alone from day to day, that it's very difficult, especially for a new legislator, to really understand and appreciate what's been going on. And you, and you tend to rely a lot on the wisdom and the experience and the counsel of others who have been here longer than you to try to guide you through. Mm -hmm. And I would say it takes probably two or three years for that to happen where you, you can actually feel comfortable with the title and with the responsibility. Not that you always catch up and, and that you know everything. It's just that you have a better idea of how to find out what you need to know at that point in time. Well, who helped guide you through the process? Well, the people that sat around me on the House floor primarily. I had a few friends as well that uh, you know I knew that I was philosophically in tune with who I would look to for guidance and because I knew that I wanted to vote the way they did because I felt the same way about issues that they did. And that doesn't take you long. In, in December, after you're elected in November, you spend several hours with other freshmen who have been elected at the same time as you, and you, you quickly find out which of those people are with you on issues, and then when you get into the full body, you find some other people. So uh, while you will depend maybe on the people who sit around you for the mechanics of the process, you will depend on your friends who you philosophically agree with on how to vote.
mm -hmm. uh, you know what your what will be a yes and what will be a no and uh, it it has a kind of a clumsiness to it but it actually works fairly well mm -hmm. well who would those people be uh, the people that I sat next to, uh, or the Representative Elner Taylor, who is retiring with me this year. Yes. Uh, another gentleman was sitting on the left, but he was a freshman, so he couldn't give me a whole lot of <laughs> advice. Uh, but I, I had known a couple of legislators ahead of time. I knew, I knew Representative Paul Clymer, I knew Representative Joe Pitts, and uh, Peter Vroon. Uh, and those three gentlemen, uh, who I agreed with almost all the time on the issues, were, were really a good source of counsel for me. Well, since you've been here for many years, did you help anybody? Uh, I don't know if I've helped anybody or not. Uh, I've given my advice, but you know what they say about free advice, it's worth what you pay for it. <laughs> and I, I think that the way that I have been helpful is to the new members who came and sat next to me. I've been able to help them in some regards, but I think because of the uh, position that I've taken, and it's a fairly conservative one on the issues, those who have agreed with me on those issues have come to me and asked for advice, uh, particularly the pro-life issue, which I'm, I'm the chairman of the House Pro-Life Caucus. So I have a lot of members who are pro-life also, and they come up to me and ask me about that issue, but then they also extend that conversation into other issues. Uh, so I would say that I would probably have been a, a positive influence on maybe another 20 or 30 legislators and may have been a negative influence on some that I don't know about. Can you explain the role of camaraderie through intercaucus, intercaucus, and individual relationships? Yes, I think that uh, sometimes, uh, unfortunately, legislators think it's us against the world, and so you find someone who you agree with on issues and you are friendly with, and that helps you through those times because we all feel at one point or another that there's some crisis in our political careers, either back home or here in the Capitol. And having a friend and somebody who's been through it before or at least can uh, commiserate with you is helpful uh, to know that you're not alone in your feelings and, and how you uh, voted and how you wanted to see an issue handled differently than it was. I think that that helps you quite a bit because you, you don't want to get on the phone and start calling people back home all the time and say, hey, you know, what should I do about this or that? You tend to look to the people here that you work with day by day and say, you know, how are you handling this? How are you voting for it? Or I, I got this letter, I got this n negative uh, input, uh, how would you do it? Uh, so you find, and in my case, which may probably be typical, you, you have five or six people that you can go to and you ask them for help or you ask them what they think and they usually give you pretty good advice. Mm -hmm. What would you say your first office was like in Harrisburg? A dump. <laughs> 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 they were in the process of doing a lot of remodeling around here when I came. They were building the East Wing. It wasn't finished yet. They were looking for places to put me. Okay. <laughs> My parking spot was, you know, three miles down the road. And uh, not really, but it was, it was out in the weather. <laughs> the... Uh, office that they gave me was small, it was dirty, the wallpaper, wallpaper was peeling off. It was in what is now known as the Ryan Office Building, which is beautiful now. It wasn't at the time in 1985. And, uh, but I was there for a few months and then they moved me into what is now the Irvis Building, which was then called the South Office Building, and that was a, that was a step up. But then when they finished the East Wing, <coughs> which was probably within three or four years of my being elected, th then it was like being in a castle because the East Wing was all new. It was, you know, mm -hmm. beautiful, new furniture, everything. It was, it was very nice. Mm -hmm. So I've only had nice offices since the East Wing was completed. <laughs> um, what would you say, um, what legislation or issues would you say are your mo most important? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the chairman of the Pro-Life Caucus in the mm -hmm. House, and that has been, for me, for 22 years, the one critical issue that I have felt very strongly about and have worked on. Uh, in 1984 when I was elected and then we started meeting in 1985, I joined the Pro-Life Caucus. I worked with Representative Steve Friend who was then the chairman, uh, doing whatever I could to help him to advance the cause of pro-life legislation. Uh, so over the years that's been the main focus. The second focus I've had is on criminal justice. Uh, I wanted to be on the Judiciary Committee, was appointed to that committee in my second term and have continued in it for 20 years. I was the subcommittee chairman on crime and corrections. I toured 20, 21 of our state prisons. I, they always let me out, fortunately. <laughs> and I had the uh, great experience of seeing our prison system and how it operated up front. 
So that was a great experience for me. Um, I've always had an interest in criminal law. I'm not a lawyer, but I, I take the perspective that you know government ought to be very precise and concise and specific about what is a violation of law and what its penalties are. And uh, through my work in the House over these 20 years, I think I've helped to improve some of the legislation through the amendment process. Uh, I had a couple of bills passed myself and uh, have felt that our criminal justice system, although it's fairly good in Pennsylvania, uh, still has room for some improvement, particularly in the prisons, where I think we oftentimes put people in but don't really make them any better by the time they come out. Not that that's always possible, but I think there are some things we can and should be doing to improve the, the lot of prisoners in, in the terms that when they come out, maybe they won't reoffend. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been the focus of my legislative career. And I, I've gotten involved in a few ancillary, or, you know, what I call minor issues, but I, I try to focus on the, the criminal justice issues and the pro-life stuff. You've um, served on many committees, as you had mentioned several. So, so many that I don't even remember them right. anymore. Um, most notably right now, you're the chairman of the Children and the Youth Committee. That's correct. What issues um, come before you as chairman? Well, the issues that tend to be assigned there are dealing with the child and youth services of each county and daycare issues. Now, we have gone into a couple of health care issues. For instance, we had a bill that came through our committee from the Senate that was providing for a mandatory option for hearing tests for infants. Apparently, infants can be tested within the first day or two for their hearing. And uh, we passed law that said that uh, any birthing place, generally a hospital, has to at least make that available to the parents to say, hey, we can, pro we can do a hearing test for you. So uh, that was good legislation to do that. Uh, we've occasionally gotten into foster care issues, we've occasionally got into adoption issues. Uh, it's a rather narrowly focused agenda that the committee deals with. Mm -hmm. One of the best things that I think our committee does is we have public hearings and we bring in guests who will explain programs and services that are available to Pennsylvanians for their children and then our legislators can take that information and use it in their district office to help their constituents. So I've always viewed the committee process as not simply one that passes bills, you know, onto the larger house, but who not only passes bills but also tries to help its members understand and appreciate the services that are available for parents and their children in Pennsylvania. And so we've had that balance, I think, between education and legislation. Mm -hmm. Did you have a favorite committee? Uh, judiciary was my favorite. That's why I stayed on it for 20 years. Okay. Uh, and I. I always said if, if I could ever get to be chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I would have taken it, but uh, the opportunity never presented itself. Okay. Um, you talked about the amendment process. How is it used and how is it effective? Well, uh, it's effective in two different ways from a strategic viewpoint. Number one, if you're in the minority, that's about the only way you're going to get a bill passed is if you make an amendment to another bill. <coughs> the, uh, the opposition party, when they're in control, don't like to make their their opponents look good, so they don't want legislation with their name on it. They're not as opposed to an amendment because an amendment's part of the larger bill and whoever the sponsor of the larger bill is gets the credit. So if you're in the minority and you understand the amendment process, you can get a lot of legislation passed. And I was able to do that when I was in the minority. Uh, the second way that the amendment process is very helpful is that you may have something that's controversial and quite frankly, pro-life stuff is controversial. Uh, so we, we never assume that because we introduce a bill that has a pro-life perspective that it's going to become law on its face. We almost always have to amend it into some other bill. Mm -hmm. And so the amendment process works for what you might consider to be legislation that's controversial because the first time members get to vote on it, it's on the House floor, it's not in a committee. Uh, things can be killed in committee rather quickly it can be dead on arrival when you introduce it, for that matter. Uh, so the amendment process works for members who, you know, have obstacles to overcome. It's actually, it benefits, you know, the minority more than it does the majority. Mm. Um, in 1997, you were named to an impact committee. Do you remember that? A task okay, tell me more. Maybe task I will. Force. It was uh, to study government agencies and to find ways to reduce costs to improve government efficiency. 
Do you recall that? Community? Yeah, and okay. I was, I think they just put my name on there because they didn't okay. want a lot of names. I didn't really have a whole lot of input into that. They did ask me, you know, what I thought about, and I gave them some suggestions about ways that I th thought that money could be saved, government could be downsized, but unfortunately, the, the results of the impact study was that most of it was ignored. Mm -hmm. Okay. In 1999 and 2000, you closed a loophole in a law that made it a first-degree misdemeanor for a person to take any type of weapon that could be used for an escapee into a penal institution. How did you find that loophole into well, in Title 18? As I indicated earlier, I was chairman of the Subcommittee on Crime and Corrections. The chairman of the committee, every time there was a prison escape, asked me to do the public hearings on it. <laughs> that particular uh, legislation was a result of an escape from the Huntington prison where people who worked in the prison helped the escapee. And we found out afterwards that the only thing they could do to them was fire them. We felt it was a criminal act to help a, a prisoner escape prison. and. The law was silent on whether or not you could do anything about them criminally. Now, they could fire them. It was a nurse who was in love with the guy, and it was another guard who uh, claimed that he didn't know what he was doing or what he was carrying into the prisoner because he was bringing gifts from afar in, into <laughs> the prisoner, which actually were weapons that he used or tools that he used to escape. So this all came out in the public hearing that I was the... Uh, you know, the MC for. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when we found out that they, they couldn't do anything to these wayward employees other than fire them, we thought, well, we need to make this a criminal offense. This, you, you can't just say you're fired. Uh, now, unfortunately, we couldn't do anything about those two people because you can't pass a law that, you know, affects something that predated the, the law, the, the old ex post facto uh, standard but it will apply to anybody in the future. Mm. Um, how, how involved were you in developing a solution for school property tax? That's uh, one of the main issues that the legislature is facing right now. And what makes this such a difficult issue to, re to solve? Well, my involvement has been through the Commonwealth Caucus, which is a member of uh, House members who uh, generally take a very conservative bent on issues. It's a bipartisan uh, caucus. And we have developed a plan over the years, it's about three years now, where we could totally eliminate school property tax by expanding the sales tax to items that are not currently taxed, but reducing it from 6%, which it is now, probably down to 5 or 5.5%. Um, we just have never been able to accumulate enough people in the House to support it. We generally can only get 70, 75 people when we've put it up for votes on uh, Amend, you know, on amendments that we've run or bills that we've run. So unfortunately, uh, that plan hasn't got enough popularity right now to mm -hmm. become law. Uh, second half of your question was? Um, why, does it, why is it difficult to uh, solve? Why is it do it, it's very difficult to deal with property tax because while everybody would like to get rid of the school property tax, or almost everybody would, this, the alternatives for supplanting that loss of income is a real bone of contention. And we found that out with our plan because if you say we want to expand the sales tax and one of those things that we expand the sales tax to is financial services, for instance, we hear from all the financial services people. If we say that we want to do it to food in the grocery store, we hear from all the grocery store owners. If we, uh, it, it, It's just wherever you push the tax to, those people scream bloody murder and don't want it to affect them. Uh, so that's the problem. Is how are you going to substitute? It's not, it's not getting rid of the school property taxes. What it substitute is that creates all the hubbub, and that's why you have a difficult time doing it. Mm -hmm. And even with our plan, we've had to make accommodations over the last three years to you know, try to take care of some screaming segment of society. Uh, for instance, the doctors. I mean, originally our proposal included a, sa a sales tax on doctor's office visits, which are typically $50, 70 $80. Well, the doctors didn't think that was fair because when you go into a doctor's office and you know you pay a fifty dollar fee, if you're paying it through your insurance, the insurance is only going to give him so much. The insurance may not give him the fifty. The insurance company may give him thirty five, and then he, they have to take the six percent out of his thirty five dollars, not out of the insurance company. They don't pay it. So uh, accommodations like that become very difficult in trying to keep the whole thing intact. Um, if we could do away with the school property tax and find some way to have 
it not be objected to, it'll pass in a moment, but we haven't found that yet. You were very active in your district, especially involving the resurgence of Prompton State Park. Correct. Why was this revitalization important to your district? Well, one of the things that you uh, will know real quickly when you visit my district is that it's very rural. Uh, the largest town in my district is less than 5,000 people. So what we have to offer economically to our people to a great extent is tourism. The Prompton Dam, which was built as a flood control dam in the 1950s or early 1960s, has created a lake that is two and a half miles long. It's very narrow, it's only maybe a quarter mile wide, but it's very long and it's, and it's excellent for boating and fishing. And there's never really been much done with it. So some local people came to me and said, you know, we've got a great opportunity here to promote this, to bring people into the area, to try to help promote ecotourism particularly because it's, you know, a natural type of activity. So we, th we decided that we would form a local group called Friends of Prompton Park. Uh, unfortunately, I got selected as the president of that because <laughs> um, I was a state representative, I suppose, and had an office and nobody else did. And I could do all the mailings and stuff and organize the meetings. And w we created the organization. Um, we have done major work on the tr what is called known as the trail system. They have literally tens of miles, I think it's like 30 miles, 31 miles of trails through this lake area. It's all surrounded by woods. There's, there's, not, a t there's not 50 homes in the area. And uh, the benefit of that was to be able to let local people who advertise on their websites say, come to Wayne County, here's, here's a lake with 30 miles of trails, here's, there's boating, there's fishing, and et cetera, et cetera. So, we were responsible for promoting the, the area, the, the park area. We built a pavilion, a picnic pavilion. Uh, we put in a parking lot. We made sure that there were Porter Johns there for people. Uh, we've also sponsored events. We've tried to get people there. We've had bird watches. We've had wild nature walks. And we've had hikings, um, trying, just trying to promote it generally so that it's a part of what is available to people who come to the area. Were there any other district projects that you were involved in? A lot of minor ones, uh, you know, fixing up um, historic properties, for instance. Mm -hmm. We just completed one in Hansdale only. I could throw a rock from my office to it. Um, Hansdale is noted for being the beginning of the canal, uh, the D&H Canal, which ultimately brought coal from Lackawanna Valley into New York City and Philadelphia. And back in the 1800s, Honesdale was the beginning of that, and so they had this huge pond reservoir that they made. It was man-made, and the wall is still there, where at least on one side of this pond, the, the boats were docked, and that wall was starting to fall apart. So I helped them by getting a grant to restore the wall. But I've done other things, you know, in, in the area. I wouldn't call any of them major, but they were important to the people that you helped them with. Mm -hmm. uh, helped uh, with the local railroad. They have a, a train line that runs a, an excursion that uh, needed help. We, we were able to help them with some extra lines and things of that sort. Um, those things are hard to remember <laughs> over a 22-year period of time. But uh, like I said, there are a lot of a lot of things you do as a legislator are very important to the people, the few people that you're helping with. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the public probably doesn't know too much about it. Yeah. Um, you are also did a lot of work regarding children, whether it was for foster kids or protecting them from abuse or obscene materials. Why is helping children seemingly a top priority to you in your legislative work? Well, I think it springs from my pro-life perspective. I think every person is a, is, should be at least a valued human being and, and should be given the best start in life they can. Part of it's also my own history. I came from a broken home. My parents more or less left me to my older brothers to raise me, uh, which they did a pretty good job, actually, uh, <laughs> all things considered. Uh, so I, I, and I'm a grandfather, and uh, you know the most valuable thing I have in this life is my family, and and I try to do for my grandkids uh, the things that weren't done for me when I was a kid. But by extension, I'd like to see also that every kid, every child in Pennsylvania has the opportunity to 
have a good, uh, normal family life and, and enjoys all of the things that we in Pennsylvania can provide for our children mm -hmm. in a way that helps them to grow up to be healthy and, and productive citizens. So uh, I guess children have always had a place in my heart and um, as I said earlier, that, that probably is a, as a result of my perspective that you are a human being from conception and you ought to be protected and, people, and, you, and you ought to, we, we at least hope, that you find yourself in a loving home. You've been involved with several controversial issues, specifically, no. <laughs> specifically uh, abortion and the definition of marriage. This was covered very widely in media outlets around the state and beyond. Why did you offer these amendments at this point in time, and why do you? Two years ago, when I offered the amendments yeah. on the family, uh, the marriage definition, uh, I think there I think there is needed today as they were two years ago. There actually were needed more than that. In the late 1990s, we passed uh, the what's called the DOA or the uh, Defense of, or is it DOM, the Defense of Marriage Act, whatever. And, and that was fine until we had a governor who then began to negotiate contracts with the state workers providing for quote unquote same sex benefits, which in a real sense tries to redefine what marriage is because historically we've only given state benefits to state workers who were married in the traditional sense. And he was trying to, through his negotiating process, I think redefine marriage and to provide benefits for people who were not married. Uh, it was actually to the point that it was, it was ludicrous in that if a, if a man and a man called themselves partners, they could get benefits. But if a man and a woman who lived together weren't married, they couldn't get the same benefits that he wanted to offer to, to a same-sex couple, which just, I mean, just blew my mind. Uh, and I, I feel very strongly that marriage is between one man and one woman, and that's what it has always been uh, historically for thousands of years by every major religion. And that the trend to try to redefine that was wrong. So the Defense of Marriage Act, I thought, needed to be fortified by the amendment. It actually turned out to be one amendment, boiled down from about 50. And that one amendment would have done several things. It had several aspects to it. But the most important was that it clearly defined marriage as being, be, being between one man and one woman, and that the, the state could not offer benefits to somebody else other than that. I felt that was an issue that if you were going to change that situation, it ought to be done by the legislature, not by the governor through a, a labor negotiating contract, which is, uh, as I said earlier, boggles my mind that he thinks he can do that. Now, at this point in time, as we sit here today, they have never received those benefits because there is a state agency that has to put that into play, and they have to establish the guidelines for it, and they've never done that. So while it's in a labor negotiating contract that's been in effect for several years, it hasn't actually happened, hasn't occurred. This, this organization, this, this group of people that determine that when, how these things get done have not approved it. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding they don't have the money for it either. So while he may have done that, uh, it, it hasn't actually been accomplished. Um, we also, through that marriage uh, language, uh, ended what is known as common law marriages. Um, we just felt that in this day and age that you, you don't need to have common law marriages anymore. And while the amendment that I had proposed was never ultimately voted on, the, we did away with the common law marriages in a later act. That was one of the less controversial things of the, about that. Uh, that was a controversial measure. Um, I will say this for the, uh, the gay rights crowd, they, they know how to generate emails. And they have a very willing accomplice in the media. Uh, I, had, I did several interviews, uh, newspapers. I did interviews with talk show radio. And ultimately, almost all of them came out and said this was a terrible idea. Some even got to the point of personal insults to myself and, and to those that supported me. And the, the issue died, and that was two years ago. Now, it was revived again this year with the proposal for a, an amendment to the state constitution to do what I was trying to do through the, the legislative process back in two years ago. Um, and that stalled, too. So as we sit here today, I'm not sure that Pennsylvania politicians have the guts to vote on this. They do in the House, but there, there's another body here that doesn't have it. So uh, that's where we sit, and well, we're, it'll be hard to 
tell you what's going to happen. I don't want to predict the future, but it's not an issue that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. You talked about the media. What role do they have in Pennsylvania politics? The media? Uh, I have two different relationships with the media. <laughs> the media that I have back home, I have a great relationship with. Uh, if they have an issue they want to talk to me about, they call me up or they drop in my office. We talk about it. They print what I say. They don't editorialize. And I think they're doing a good job of journalism. The larger media, I think, in Pennsylvania does a, a terrible job. They editorialize all the time in their so-called news articles. Uh, the ultimate uh, I, illustration that I give people is that back in 1989 when we were debating the 1989 Abortion Control Act, which did become law and is law today, I was quoted as speaking on the House floor and they called me a yehu. Another person who also debated the issue was called a yokel. Now that's in the news article, that's not in the editorial. If they want to call me a yehu or a yokel in the editorial, that's fine. But don't print a news article where you're talking about what the debate was about and it says a yokel got up and said and another yehu got up and said. That's a, that's a, a classic illustration of how liberal and how uh, unprofessional, I think, newspapers have become. And that particular illustration was in the Philadelphia Inquirer. I've seen the same sorts of things in the Harrisburg Patriot, in the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, throughout the state. I think the, the news media, the print media in particular, I'm, it's not so much the uh, TV media, but the print media has lost professionalism to the point where they want to editorialize and persuade people on their way of thinking through the news articles and through the editorials. And getting back to the illustration of the, the marriage amendment that I passed, um, it was interesting that I would talk to an a, a reporter, for instance, from the Post-Gazette or Philadelphia Inquirer, and I would answer their questions. And to the most extent, they, they, they were fairly uh, objective about it, which I was surprised that they, they, did <laughs> they didn't editorialize as much as I thought they would. But then they would come out with the editorial you know, and, and, uh, and, and talk about how I was a knuckle-dragging Neanderthal and a moron and, a, you know, a throwback to the 1800s. And, I mean, personal insult to newspapers is the way they think now they can convince people of a point of view, which I think demeans the process and demeans the newspaper and turns people off. And it's probably one of the main reasons why newspapers are losing circulation, I think. They're out of tune with the people in Pennsylvania, the big media. As I said, I have no problem with the local people, the, you know, the, paper, the papers that have a circulation of 10,000, for instance. I mean, they, they tend to do a good job and they, they tell things as they are, but the larger the newspaper, the less inclined they are to print the facts and the, and the issues and more inclined they are to try to influence them. Mm -hmm. What do you think is key to get, getting legislation passed? Know the process. <laughs> mm -hmm. A lot of great ideas around here that because the person who has a great idea doesn't know the process never gets anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can criticize the legislature for being slow and cumbersome, and it is. And you can criticize the people who are there for you know, worrying about their own turf, et cetera, and so forth. But if you know the system, if you know how to work the system, you can get things done. Some people just don't know how to work the system mm -hmm. how or don't put the effort into working the system. I mean, I, let me give you a quick illustration. Um, Senator Vance uh, from the Camp Hill area was a House member last session, and she and I both agreed that there was a need to change the law dealing with foreign adoptions. When you adopt a child in another country, let's say you go over to China and you adopt a child, and that happens a lot because it's difficult to adopt in the United States, the, the government of China will say that this, this adoption is final. There's no strings attached. You don't have to come back in 10 years. So you don't have to report to us. You have this child. It is yours. People were coming back to Pennsylvania, and depending on the county that you lived in, they were told they had to re-adopt a child, which is a, a cost of somewhere between seven and $10,000 when it wasn't necessary. Some counties said yes. Some counties said no. So we found out that there were several counties in Pennsylvania where, that were telling people they had to readopt when they really didn't need to. So Senator Vance and I drafted legislation last session. It's really what we call no-brainer. It made sense to, to say to the counties, clarified that there is no reason for people to readopt. 
You shouldn't have to do that if the adoption was final in another country. It took us three years to get that done. We just got it done in the last few weeks. Now, that's an easy one, <laughs> and it took three years. Imagine how some issues like eliminating property tax become so difficult. And um, but we knew the, we know the rules. I mean, Senator Vance is a, you know she's very savvy legislator. She knows what's going on, and so do I, of course. You know. Uh, and with all of our effort combined, and her in the House and her in, uh, her in the Senate and me in the House and working together, we finally got this thing done, but, and, and there was minor opposition to it. So uh, it, it can become a very difficult process. Mm -hmm. And I think the people who are most frustrated by it are the people who don't know the process or who aren't willing to do what it takes to make the process work for them which includes going into people's offices and asking for their help and making sure that every T is crossed and every I is dotted and you, you know, and you keep push. You gotta push, push, push. If you want legislation passed, you have to be the prime pusher of it. It isn't gonna happen by accident. You don't introduce a bill and watch it go to committee and all of a sudden next thing the governor's signing. It doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. You have to baby it all the way through the process. Well, how frustrating is it whenever a bill that is a good bill doesn't get the uh, deserved attention or go anywhere. Well, very frustrating if it's my bill, but <laughs> I, don't, and I don't worry too much about other people's bills, um, although obviously I do support other people's bills. So I, it, it can be frustrating. I, I've always uh, given people the illustration that it's like traveling down the highway. If you wanted to go from on the turnpike from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, it's 300 and some miles. If you stay on the road, and don't get off, you're fine. But there are all these exits along the way, and you could imagine each exit as being an obstacle. You know, exit one is uh, the chairman of the co committee doesn't like this bill, so he's not going to vote it out of committee. Uh, exit number two is uh, the, the majority leader doesn't like this bill, he's not going to let you vote on it. Or exit number three is this, this special interest group doesn't like your bill, so they're trying to derail. So to get from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh without having to be forced off on any exits is very difficult because getting a bill passed from let's say Philadelphia is introducing it and Pittsburgh's the governor signing it, there's a lot of obstacles to overcome. A lot of people don't want you to make that trip, you know, and they will get in your way. Some will cooperate with you to make it happen, but a lot of people will try to stop it from happening. So opposition to any legislation, even no quote-unquote no-brainers, appears and sometimes derails legislation. So if you know the process, you know how to overcome those, or at least you, in most cases you do. Mm -hmm. How did you work with both Democratic and Republican leadership to resolve legislative issues? Uh, occasionally, you have to sit down, talk to them, and say, hey, you know, I know that you may not like this bill, but I'm here to tell you that we're going to do it. So if you'll cooperate, and, and I'll cooperate with you, we'll try to make it a better bill that you may be able to live with more so than otherwise. Uh, generally, uh, you tend to work with your leadership group much more closely than you do the other parties, particularly if your leadership group is in the majority, mm -hmm. which has been the case for me in the last um, 12 years. So you have the opportunity to talk with them and, s and ask them, you know, to put a bill up for a vote or whatever. And then the other side's leadership generally doesn't support your legislation unless asked, and oftentimes not even when you are asked, but you go to the individual members. So being a Republican, I would ask Democratic members for their support individually. And if you do that and you can do it successfully, you'll get lots of votes to get your bills passed. Um, moving on to technology and traditions of the House, how did you and the House of Representatives deal with major events that affected the way that Pennsylvanians lived, such as the Iraq wars, September 11th, natural disasters? A lot of those things are out of our hands. I mean, uh, state legislators have very little to do with the war in Iraq mm -hmm. uh, or 9-11. However, some of those things filter down to us. Uh, for instance, in the war in Iraq, we have beefed up our state support for veterans. We have passed legislation that helps them to not worry about their jobs when they leave, to not worry about their finances. That gives them some financial help, gives them counseling, gives them um, you know, some tax breaks, things of that sort. So that's a national issue, but we did have a response on a statewide level. 9-11, uh, 
is a, is a similar scenario in that because the nation now is much more defensive, <laughs> you know, about protecting our borders and preventing another terrorist attack, we in Pennsylvania have passed legislation that is tightening up things like illegal skidding license plate or driver's licenses, um, things like um, just security measures. Uh, we've beefed up our, and we, we actually created a homeland security in Pennsylvania, which we didn't have before 9-11. Uh, so they're working on coordinating emergency response teams and things of that sort. So the national issues sometimes in their original impact are national, but then they start to filter down through the state and we begin to think of some things that we can do on a state level. So that, that would be two illustrations I could give you. Mm -hmm. How would you compare the technology of the House today to that during your first years in office? Uh, Stone Age to the modern age. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that uh, used to impress me about the early years was that we had a ton of paper on our desk, especially at budget time. You probably could have saved a couple of trees if you had not printed everything. I actually went up to Bill DeWeese when he was the Speaker of the House, and I was in the minority, and this had to be somewhere around 1990, 91. And I said to him, I said, Bill, I said, you know what, we could save a lot of money. and be a lot more organized if we had computers on our desktops. Well, he didn't do anything with the idea other than pat me on the back and tell me it was a great idea. Uh, but then when Speaker Ryan, uh, the Republican, became the Speaker of the House, uh, he did follow through on that and eventually we did get laptops. So the laptops on the House floor are much better than a ton of paper sitting there and you don't know where, which paper is where and how do I find this. And uh, So it became uh, a better organizational tool, but I think it probably does save us money. Mm -hmm. Because even though the initial upfront cost on a laptop is not cheap, even when you buy them wholesale like we do, uh, you, you do print an awful lot of paper. And I think that it ultimately did save us money. Now, that's on the House floor. Um, we've also done a lot of technological advances in our constituent service. Uh, I mentioned earlier doing email blasts, doing public service announcements through TV and radio, which are very effective. Uh, but we've also updated our computer systems in our district offices so that we're all linked together. It, when I was first elected, the only way you could get a copy of a bill to a constituent was you had to call down to the document room and say, hey, can you send me a copy of this? And they literally had these huge revolving bins where they kept all these copies of the bills. And if they had one on hand, that was great. If they didn't, they had to go fac or you know copy it somewhere and get it to you. So it was a, like a three, four day process before you got it. Then you had to send it to your constituent. But now we have access to that through our computer system. We can print it out and we can have it in the constituent's hand in a matter of seconds. So uh, that's been a, a really a big help. Mm -hmm. And there's probably a bunch of other things we've done that I don't remember because they, they sort of added them one, one by one and I don't re remember every improvement they made. Is it a good idea to have a cell phone, a Blackberry, always, so you're always in touch with everybody? Yes and no. <laughs> um, I'm particularly sensitive to this as the chairman of a committee because I'm holding a committee hearing and people's cell phones are going off while I'm trying to conduct a hearing, which I find very aggravating almost to the point of being rude. Uh, but I understand that people feel they need to be contacted. Uh, my attitude towards the cell phone was that I'll turn it on when I need it on, and I won't turn it on if I don't, and I don't want people tracking me down every minute of the day. Uh, but with the newer versions that cell phones have, all these other functions, it's not just a cell phone. They, they keep their calendars there and they you know take messages and things of that sort. So I guess it's a good idea if, as long as it doesn't uh, create other problems. Mm -hmm. Could you describe your district offices and uh, how do they, you have, I think, a few, don't you? Well, actually, I have one district office in Honesdale in Wayne County, but every Friday I go to a different location. Usually uh, it's a county office or a township building, and I advertise those office times that I'm there, and I'm there from 9 until noon, no appointment necessary. Uh, I found them to be very helpful to reach my district. When I first was elected, my district was almost 100 miles from one end to the other to drive it. Now, it's gotten much shorter. Uh, it's only about 50 miles now from one end to the other. Uh, but I still do those visits on Friday mornings, and sometimes I sit there for three hours and nobody comes, but most of the time there's two or three people that come, and they have a problem, and I'm able to help them with it, and they might not have 
bothered to do that if they had to drive to my district office. So, mm -hmm. and it gets me out in the district, helps me to see what's going on in terms of the roads and the buildings and events that are going on. What role does seniority play in the house? Huh, big, <laughs> real big. You don't. I mean, seniority is the basis on which chairmanships are handed out. Um, and I was here 16 years before I became a chairman. So I had to wait a long time to be the chairman of a committee. So senior members, you know, get the, the chairmanships. And generally, senior members get the leadership roles, although that's not, you don't have to be a senior member to get leadership. But nobody's going to vote for you for leadership until you've been here for a few terms. Uh, just doesn't make sense. So seniority does help a lot. Uh, it, I'm not sure it helps you a whole lot in getting legislation passed, other than you're dealing with other senior members when your bill wants to, goes to a different committee and you want help on it. Uh, but it does make a difference in terms of the chairmanship and leadership. What type of relationship do you have with lobbyists? Pretty good. I've always uh, viewed lobbyists as people who had a point of view they wanted to share with me. Uh, they're not the evil people that the press makes them out to be maybe a couple of them are, but most of them are there to do a job to represent the people that are paying their salary. And the people who pay their salary have a legitimate interest in and a right to influence legislation because if it affects them, why shouldn't they? And if they can afford to hire somebody to be a presence here for them, so be it. And that doesn't mean that I, I do whatever a lobbyist tells me to do. It doesn't mean that uh, lobbyists are in a position to get things done that they shouldn't be getting done, but they bring to the attention of members issues that they didn't know about oftentimes. So I've always viewed lobbyists as, as good educators to me on a particular subject. Uh, and I've had many of opportunity where lobbyists come in and say, hey, Jerry, couldn't you vote for this, that, or the other thing? I said, no. Come back next time and we'll talk about the next issue, you know. And I think if you're up front with lobbyists, tell them why you can or cannot support them. Uh, they're, they're all right with that. I mean, they're still doing their job, but, uh, and they understand that not everybody's going to agree with them. But uh, I think a lobbyist is a really a, an important function of the legislature because we can't know everything about every bill. Hard, hard to believe, I know, but we just don't know everything about every bill. And lobbyists will give you, and, and most good lobbyists will give you the pros and cons of what they're for or against. They'll say, hey, uh, here's why we're for it, but here's, here's what people who are against it are going to tell you. And they're pretty honest and accurate about that. And then you make the judgment call as to whether or not you think you can support or not support their mm -hmm. particular interest. I've been told that you share a birthday with several representatives. Yeah. <laughs> such as Easy Taylor, um, past representative Howard Fargo, and uh, majority leader or minority leader uh, Bill DeWeese. Uh, which is the most interesting one. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and well, also Tom Quigley, who is currently a member. Oh, great. <laughs> that, that's quite a popular day. What was that like knowing that all these other representatives uh, share the same birthday? Well, I was shocked that I had anything in common with Bill DeWeese. Um, <laughs> Bill DeWeese is off to the left, I'm off to the right. Neither one of us apologizes for it. Um, he's, he's a year younger than me, I might point out, but uh, it is kind of strange. And we've gone out and had celebrated our birthdays together. That's one of the interesting things about politics is you can stand on the House floor and fight each other on an issue, and you can go out to dinner and celebrate your birthday with that person. Uh, so it, it, it's part of that camaraderie thing. The House is, to some extent, a, a big fraternity. I mean, we can fight like cats and dogs sometimes over issues, but that, as long as we don't make it personal, we can still respect the other person. We can still have a laugh with them and, and share experiences. And uh, that's why I say, I, you know, Bill DeWeese and I are so far apart politically that it is kind of interesting that we have the same birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Could you talk about the Republican Democratic activities such as softball and basketball games, tennis matches? Were you involved in any of those? Uh, yeah, tennis and basketball. When I was first elected in 84, uh, I was only 35 years old and I was in much better shape than I am now. And I found some other guys that like to play tennis. Some were Democrats, some were Republicans. And oftentimes in the spring, you would get off the House floor at, you know, 3 or 4 o'clock, and you'd want to do something, and you didn't want to just sit around and, you know, you'd sit at your desk and, and vegetate. So we, we would go out in the local tennis courts, have a real good time playing tennis. Uh, we used to play 
well, they still do, I guess, but I used to play basketball every Tuesday night. They would uh, get the court over at the Harrisburg Area Community College, and uh, members were invited to come over, and we would sometimes have 20, 30 guys to come out, use two different courts, and just pick up games, and, you know, whoever were the better players got picked, and <laughs> the guys that weren't so good sat and watched for a while, but uh, that was not a partisan thing. That was just a good time out and good exercise and kind of things that uh, you have good memories of. What was it like presiding as speaker pro tem? I've enjoyed filling in as a speaker uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, having been a teacher, I always liked the, the idea that I was in charge. And uh, being in charge as a speaker is much more difficult than being a teacher. Uh, if, these, if the House members acted that way when they were kids in school, they'd have gotten thrown out of school, I think. Uh, there's, it's, it's hard to keep the, the, the mob under control, but um, I do enjoy it. I, I find that it helps me to be much more sharp mentally because you have to listen to everything everybody says. If you're sitting on the House floor and another member is at the microphone, talking about an issue. If you want to listen, you listen. If you don't, you, you know, you turn to your neighbor and you start talking or you pick up a newspaper and read it or whatever. But when you're a speaker, you, when you're up there, you have to know everything that's going on. You have to know what everybody's saying and you have to keep track of who's supposed to speak next and whether or not they're out of order. And, and you also have the parliamentarian sitting or standing to your left and he's whispering in your ear about what to do next. And the gentleman who stands to the right of the speaker is telling you who's the next guy that's going to be speaking at the microphone and so-and-so is asking for recognition. So it's sort of like you're like a traffic cop in a lot of ways, uh, but you're, you know, you're trying to keep 200 members <laughs> on track going in the same direction. So it's a very challenging position. I enjoy it, and um, uh, I'll, that's probably one of the things I will miss when I'm not here anymore is the ability to fill in a speaker. And since we're the Republicans went in the majority, uh, I've probably filled in there probably 70, 80 times, quite a bit. Uh, one other interesting aspect to this is uh, Phil DeWeese and I have the same birthday. Uh, when we went out to dinner once when he was speaker, and I said to him, Bill, I said, I'd like you to let me be speaker for a while as a birthday present. And you know he did that. And that's a rare thing that, you know, speakers usually only pick people to fill in for them who are of their same party. And I and Bill are not of the same party, but because we had the same birthday, the next day he let me go in and fill in a speaker for the first like 15 or 20 minutes. I thought that was a real hoot. <laughs> Did you ever consider running for another public office um, besides the House? Yeah, I've thought of running for Congress. I um, I would not run for anything else at this point in time. Uh, the office of the U.S. House of Representatives I think would be very challenging. It would be a step up from what I'm doing now. It would be a much larger district, a lot bigger constituency, uh, more time involved, and uh, a, a diff more difficult job, I think. Uh, but I'm at the point in my life now where I'm ready for that kind of a challenge. If that were to occur, an opening uh, in my congressional district were to happen, then I would seriously consider that. Mm. What aspect of your job as a House member did you like the most? The work I do back home, the fact that you can help people, you can solve problems. People walk in my office all the time with a problem and most of the time walk out with a solution. And that's, in, that's not just me, but that's my staff. I have very capable staff and people who I depend on you know, to do a good job and they do a good job. But uh, we're very happy and pleased with the job that we do back home. That, to me, is the most satisfying part of the job. What about the least? <laughs> <laughs> the least satisfying is when we're in session <laughs> and seeing uh, some of the things that happen here, some of the bills that are voted that uh, I feel very strongly are not the right thing to do, and I'm in the minority, and it happens anyway. That's, that's hard to swallow. And I think, I think most of the people who quit after a f couple of terms are people who have never learned to handle that part of the job because everybody looks like a hero back home if they do their work, and, uh, and we work hard at constituent work. But to, to be successful down here means you have to be sort of like a baseball player who hits 250. He realizes he's, getting out, he's getting out three fourths of the time. He's only winning one fourth of the time with one hit out of four at bats. And sometimes it's even less than that as a legislator. Maybe, you know, maybe one tenth of what you vote for actually becomes law and the other nine things you voted against did. So uh, you have to learn to accept the fact that you're one of 203 in the House. 253 of the House and Senate combined, and you're just not going to have a whole lot of success sometimes because other people don't see things the way you do. 
And you can't let that frustration defeat you. You have to learn to accept that you're going to lose, maybe frequently, and still continue to do what you want to do. And, and then when you look back at your career, you say, here's what I got done. Here's what other people got done maybe I didn't care for, but here's what I got done. And, and you can take some pride in that. When you recount your experiences in the house, do you have a favorite story? Um, well, I have a favorite, uh, yeah, a memory. I don't know that it's, it's a good one for the public. <laughs> Uh, but uh, when, in 1991, when we were at an impasse over the budget, we were going into August, and people were getting testy. It was hot. They didn't want to be there. The state had, we weren't getting paid. Some state workers weren't getting paid. It was a difficult situation, and, and Governor Casey at the time was trying to promote a big tax increase to get the budget passed. Well, we were in one particular night, and we had a photographer that worked for us, for the House Republicans who was taking pictures on the floor and they're allowed to do that but he's not allowed to take pictures of the voting board and some of the Democrat members thought he had done that and they were getting all upset so uh, the story was that he he said he wasn't taking him but he thought he, he saw that they were getting quite upset with him so he started to walk from the Democrat side over to the Republican side and one of the members chased him uh, literally was chasing after him because he was going to take the camera and rip the film out and all that kind of stuff but, um, as he was coming down the side aisle along the wall, uh, Representative Dennis Lay gave this House member who was chasing our photographer a, a hockey hip check, hit him into the, <laughs> into the wall and uh, almost knocked him to the floor. He kind of stumbled and went down and pretended as if it was an accident. Uh, and in the meantime, the photographer made his escape out the back of the hall of the house. And uh, so I always thought that was kind of interesting that that sort of thing would happen. Um, in 1997 and 2004, you were honored with the Guardian of Small Business Award by the National Federation of Independent Businesses. What do you, what do awards such as this mean to you? Well, the National Federation of Independent Businessmen is an organization that represents small business people who, you know, mom and pop organizations. Um, I've always had a pro-business voting record, pro-business attitude towards legislation, and to me that's just your friends thanking you for being who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, they recognize the fact that I, I did what I said I would do. I, and I guess if there's anything I could say was probably, I believe, the hallmark of my 22 years was I always did what I said I would do. I didn't double talk. I didn't rat out anybody. I didn't, I wasn't a hypocrite. You might not like what I said, but I did what I said I would do, and I stand by it. And I think when you get awards like that, and I've gotten other awards from other organizations, uh, it's basically a, an affirmation that you stayed the course, you said you would do such and such, and you did it. Mm -hmm. um, what do you believe are your greatest accomplishments? Helping the 1989 Abortion Control Act be passed, helping the uh, fetal homicide bill become law, helping just recently the quote-unquote Burmalin Amendment, which restricts uh, abortion activities in Pennsylvania through the budget process, become statute. It had been a part of the budget every year for the last seven years, but we finally made it statute this year, um, helping with the foreign adoptions things. I had an interesting bill that was <laughs> it's called Bottle Club Bill. Uh, a few years ago, the um, bottle clubs, which are not liquor licensed establishments, were also having uh, live new dancing. And we, we had instance after instance all over the state of neighbors who were complaining about the fact that these men were going into these establishments, getting liquored up, going out in the parking lot, smashing bottles and creating all kinds of problems, and some of which we can't say here in public. Um, so what we did was we, I passed a bill that said that you can either have the bring your own bottle drinking or the nude activities, but you can't have both in the same place. So it really put a damper on their activities. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know which they, I think in most cases they reverted back to bring your own bottles and forgot about the nudity. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, we, since we passed that bill, we've had virtually no complaints about these places. So, you know, it's one or the other, but you can't have both. And that was my legislation that did that. And I was surprised how effective it was. <laughs> 
Since you'll be retiring at the end of the session, is there any legislation that you'd like to see completed before you leave? Uh, at this point, probably not. I mean, I still have a couple of bills that I think should become law, and if I don't get the job done, then I'm going to ask somebody who succeeds me to do that. But I think what we were able to accomplish in the last two weeks with the uh, foreign adoption bill and with the uh, restrictions on uh, appropriations for abortion uh, related activities as opposed to family planning, I think they were the two biggest things I wanted to get done before I left here, and we got them done. So I guess I'm on cruise control now <laughs> for the last few months. <laughs> Upon retirement, what are your plans? Well, I, I really don't know. Um, I'm 57. I am too young to just retire, retire, and not ever work again. Uh, but because of a lot of long service in the house, 22 years, plus I was a teacher and such, I have over 31 years in the pension system. I have enough through the pension to live on. So I'm unique in that aspect that I can just sort of do what I want to do and not have to do what I have to do. Uh, so if something comes along that interests me, something that I think I can contribute to and, and that it will make a difference in society, I'm not interested in a job just for the money, but if I can do something that makes a difference for what I consider to be a, a better society that we live in, I'll probably seriously consider that. Do you think you'll still remain active in politics? No unless I run for Congress. <laughs> um, I would at least want a break from it. Um, and I've been fortunate. I, you know, I only had two opponents after I got elected in 84. I've only had two campaigns where I had somebody running against me, and only one of them was a really serious candidate. So I haven't had the real hard campaigns that a lot of go guys go through and have to put up with you know, all the negatives that they, they deal with. So I've been pretty fortunate that way. But it does wear on you. Um, there comes a point in time when you just don't want to get up and go to that dinner and spend the night away from home again, or you know, get to ha go get in the car to go to Harrisburg because you know you're going to be away three or four days again. There, there, there's that point in time where you just want to break from it, and I think I'm at that point. And that's one of the reasons why I decided not to run again. I just felt that uh, if you can get legislator burnout, that I was on the edge of getting that. So. I'm young enough to do other things and old enough to know better than to do the wrong things. My last question. Do you have any advice for new members? Yeah, I wrote it down, too. I'm going okay. to make sure I get this quoted right because I think this is the smartest thing I ever said to a new member. I would say, I would say to a new member, there's two equally big mistakes that you can make. Taking yourself too seriously but not taking your job seriously enough. I've seen too many people who come down here with the inflated egos. You know, they get what I call the God complex. They think, oh, you know, people love me back home. I'm elected. I'm a state representative, blah, blah, blah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wonderful. <clears throat> and they take themselves too seriously. On the other hand, sometimes they don't take their job seriously enough. They don't study the legislation, they don't know the issues, they don't care how they vote, uh, they're not doing their work back home that they get elected to do. I think that's an equally important mistake to make. I'll put this all in perspective with a story that I share with people. When I was running for office, um, I was gone a lot. My, my daughters, who were then somewhere around 10 to 15 years old, uh, knew what was going on, but they weren't really involved in it. Uh, and my daughter and my well, wife, or daughters and my wife would come home at the end of the day and they'd get the mail and, you know, they'd see all this campaign stuff and whatever. And it was, a, every, all my mail was addressed to Jerry Berman. Within the first week after I won the election in November of 1984, my daughter, who is 10 years old at the time, is getting the mail every day and all of a sudden I'm getting these letters of congratulations. And the, and the title is The Honorable Jerry Berman. So for about a week, she's getting picking up the mail, and she's seeing all these letters. So we're sitting at dinner one night, and she says, can I ask you a question, Dad? Yeah, sure. I mean, when did you become honorable? You know, it's not me. It's the job. And that's, that's what I try to tell people. Be honorable, because the job is honorable. It's not so much about you. It's about the position you hold. And my daughter just deflated me like <laughs> in 10 seconds like nothing else could but that's the truth of the matter 
you don't become honorable. You either are or you aren't. But the title is such that you, when you hold a position, you ought to treat it honorably. And I think I've tried to do that, and I've been fairly successful at doing that. And that would be my advice to new members. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This concludes our interview. You did a lot of research on it. I tried. <laughs>